Hey guys, what's the top seven mistakes a home buyer makes, especially a first time home buyer? I'm Scott with the Davidson Reels team. I'm gonna share them with you real quick and give you a quick little explanation on all of them. Hopefully this will help you make a better decision and to do it the right way. So the first thing is quite honestly, a lot of people start looking for homes without applying first. So they go into the whole idea of, hey, that $250,000 house looks really great. And they get their hopes up, they fall in love with it, and then they find out they can only qualify for $200,000, or maybe they can qualify for $500,000, but the fact is they don't know what the budget would create with a $250,000 home. So that's number one. Number two is that they talk to only one lender. So when a lender is going to ask you questions about your social security number, your income and stuff like that, they're going to ask those questions. But then if you talk to a second lender, they're going to ask sometimes a different set of questions. So how do you know what the best questions are? Cause you've only talked to one person. So I would talk to two or three, quite honestly, it's not an issue that you're necessarily going to get a better rate all the times, but sometimes one, you click with better, click better with somebody. And two, sometimes you just, you think they actually sound a little bit more competent, so you just feel more confident going into that process with them. So I thought that I'd mention that one. Three, when you look for a house, are you buying a house or are you buying a neighborhood? And let me give you this example. If you'd been in Grant Park, which is downtown Atlanta, if you'd been in there you know, 30 years ago, you'd been like a pioneer. If you had looked at that situation, you wouldn't have necessarily, you'd have still loved the houses, but you'd have looked at the neighborhood and thought, mm, I don't know, you know, the neighborhood's not quite here. And what you have to realize is the neighborhood's gonna grow. It's either going up, it's flat, or it's going down. So I would look at the trend of the neighborhood and then look at the house itself. Because at the end of the day, I know you love your house or you want to love your house, but the reality is you really wanna love your neighborhood. And if it all came down to it and I helped you buy a house, I'm gonna put you in a house that may not be the best house in the best neighborhood. Because the, be the, the, the not best house in the best neighborhood and then you can turn it into the best house with updating and renovations and doing your own customization to it. That's the one where you can buy low and sell high. You don't wanna be the biggest house and you don't wanna be the best house going in because you're gonna pay top dollar. And you surely don't wanna be the best house in a bad neighborhood that doesn't even go up, but it goes down. And now you've paid too much and you're watching your appreciation go down, which is depreciation, right? So the fourth one is when you're a new buyer, a lot of, them are, a lot of people are looking for the unicorn. They're looking for the perfect house. And I hate to tell you, most of us who have bought several houses really realize quickly there's not going to be a perfect house it's going to be a great house and out of a hundred percent perfect you're probably going to get in the 80 to 90 percent range so get one that's great but don't start looking for the unicorn that has to be a hundred percent perfect because it most of the time doesn't exist find the 80 to 90 and then fix the other five or ten percent to get you into the 90s and that'll be fantastic for your family i promise because some of the stuff you thought you needed you really don't need and some of the stuff you think you wanted isn't really worth the money that it would take to get it so there's that the, the unicorn philosophy the fifth part <clears throat> is not a, a, um, allowing enough money in your, to stay in your bank account for the cost of home ownership. So let me explain a little further. So you get into a house and say your mortgage is $1,500 a month, but what you don't really think about is you probably need to be saving anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 a year just for those little incidentals. Your HVAC might go out, you might have a water heater, you might have to do some caulking and painting and stuff like that and the little cost of home ownership that all of a sudden if you drained all your money getting into the house and you left nothing in the savings, that's not gonna work out really well because then you bought a great house and it's just gonna decline in value or, or I should say in condition because you're deferring the maintenance on it. So, you know, find out how much you can afford, come down maybe to 70 or 80% at most, and then leave yourself that buffer to keep the house in great shape. That'll help you keep your appreciation and your equity in place. The sixth one, is of course, I'm partial to this one, is that people don't use a realtor. You know, as a buyer, a realtor is free. I don't know if you knew that, but I can't believe how many people I've talked to when I say that. They're like, no, it's not. It costs 3%. Yes, but for the most part in our market area, the seller pays the buyer agent fee. So the realtor's free for the buyer to work with. And with that being said, why wouldn't you use the expertise and the skills and the time of somebody who does this every single day? So use a realtor. Don't try to do this on your own. You're not familiar with the contracts and you're not familiar with the process most of the time. And I'm not talking down, but I'm really just saying we do this every single day so we can help you maneuver through that a lot smoother and try to keep you out of trouble, obviously. And the last one, and this is gonna sound very counterintuitive to a lot of people, 
is that a lot of people put too much money down. So talk to that lender and ask them, okay, how much is it gonna cost to, to put down? Is it 3%, 3.5%, 5%, 20%? Because a lot of our parents told us 20%, right? Well, if you go for a $200,000 house and you have to come up with $40,000, that's gonna be great, it'll keep you out of mortgage insurance, but then that's $40,000 that's just kind of there and it's hard to get to. Now, there are advantages to doing that, but there's also a big advantage to doing something with a lower down payment, having that cash in the bank for emergency and for repairs, and then just having a slightly higher mortgage. And then, you know, think about it. Is it easier to come up with $20,000 in cash, or is it easier to come up with $150 per month? Because last I checked, $150 into $20,000 is like 18 years. I mean, it's a lot. So with that being said, some people just put down too much money. They drain their account, then they can't afford to keep the house. Whereas if they put less down, they can afford to keep it longer. And if that created a problem where you had to sell, you have more time for the transition. So I hope this was helpful. And I know some of it's very counterintuitive. Some of it might be very logical, but I hope it helps. Look, the fact is we're trying to help you guys make the best decision. It's not about us. It's all about you. We want to consult you and help you to make the best decision for you or your family. And whatever questions you might have, give us a call. We're happy to help and answer those questions. So I hope you have a fantastic day. Call the Davidson Real Team. Real estate made easy.